Good evening to one and all. Welcome. Ten spies obsessed with love, but sometimes you have to say goodbye. It remains a great enigma and mystery. How did it happen? How is it that the 12 scouts, Miraglim, which Moshe Rabbeinu Moses sends to survey the land of Israel, to prepare it for the Jewish conquest and settlement, ends in such disaster? Not only do they do not fulfill their mission for which Moses sent them, but they come back with such an ill-fated report instilling fear, terror, and dread in the hearts of the entire Jewish nation, dissuading them from their dream, their goal, to enter into the Promised Land. From the day God chose Moses to become the Redeemer of the Jewish people, this was the goal, this was the plan. Already in the Genesis, of his mission, God tells him, I will take them out of Egypt and I will bring them to the land of Canaan, the land of Canaan. This has been the mission statement, the goal, the destination. Moses chooses in the beginning of Shlach, 12 of the greatest, most prominent leaders and representatives of Israel. And they come back and what they do is they manage to cause mass hysteria among the Jewish people, having the men break out in endless tears and mourning, believing that by entering the land they will simply be killed, they, their wives and their children, and they are determined not to enter into the land. How do 10 of the most prominent men of Israel chosen by Moses himself, turn around so swiftly to become such rebellious traitors, to betray their master, to betray God, to betray the dream and the promise of the Jewish people, and to turn an entire nation around. Every one of the spies besides two, Yehoshua, Joshua, and Kalev, they were the only two scouts who came back determined to enter the land, but the other ten turned the entire picture around, as a result of which the ten spies die, and God decrees that the entire nation will not enter the land. They will remain for four decades in the desert, and only the younger generation, those who were not 20 at the time, would see the promised land. Throughout the generations, every commentator, of course, had something to say about this question. Every commentator in his own unique style presented a perspective of how to understand this story. One of the great explanations is certainly the one presented by Rabbi Schneir Zalman of Liadi, the Alter Rebbe, the founder of Chabad, born in 1745, passed away in 1812, and in his monumental work, Lekutei Torah, on the portion of Shlach, explains in his words that the spies were b'madrega gavoya ma'oid. They were not simple degenerates, they were actually on a very lofty spiritual level, and he explains that the spies had a very sublime and lofty objective, namely, they cherished the experience in the desert, encompassed by clouds of glory, eating manna from heaven, being nurtured by the water from Miriam's moving well, in the proximity of the sanctuary with the Divine Presence, guided by Moshe Rabbeinu and Aaron, free from any financial worries, any political calculations, any military stress, 
any concerns, but rather living in a transcendental oasis. They did not want to enter a land where they will have to take control for their lives, where they will be subjected to the pressures and the onslaught of material pressures and needs, the need to establish their own economic infrastructure, their own political infrastructure, a military infrastructure, a national infrastructure. Eretz Eichelas Yeshver, it's a land which consumes its inhabitants, which the Alter Rebbe Rabbi Shnei explains to me, the mean that it's a land that will eat up and may destroy the spiritual integrity, the purity, the idealism, of the people. It's very interesting because uh, this is parenthetical, because this was a major complaint, very different era and very different people. I don't mean to compare it on all levels, but when uh, Theodor Herzl began his, uh, founded the world Zionist movement, Benjamin Zev Herzl, in the early 19, uh, in the late 1800s at the end of the 19th century. Major debate broke out even among the secular Jews about Zionism. And one of the very famous Jewish thinkers from Germany, Martin Buber, who opposed uh, national Zionism deeply, believed that for the Jewish people to run their own country would be a disaster because it would cause their moral breakdown and corruption. And it's much healthier for the Jews to remain spiritual, moral compasses of civilization. But that's beyond the topic of today's, tonight's class. Back to our discussion, Rabbi Shnei Zalman believed that the spies simply wanted to remain isolated in the desert, in the cocoon of holiness and spirituality. And yet it was a mistake because God's objective and the ultimate purpose of life is not to escape the material world, but to transform it. And not to escape the pressures of day-to-day -day life and the vulnerable mortality of the human psyche and the human physical self, which was hibernating in the desert, but rather to confront it, to engage it, to deal with it, ultimately to transform the very physicality of our natures, of our bodies, and of our world into an abode for the divine. This evening I want to introduce another explanation. And later at the end of the class we hope to show the synchronization of the two explanations. This explanation I came across presented by a man named Reb Shmuel Vital. Let's discuss him for a few moments. Reb Shmuel Vital was born in the year 1598. He passed away in the year 1677. He was from the great rabbis and mystics of Damascus, Damascus in Syria. He was born in Damascus in 1598. His father was the famed Rabbi Chaim Vital. Who was Rabbi Chaim Vital? Rabbi Chaim Vital was born in 1543 and passed away in 1620, was the prime student of that reason. Rabbi Yitzchak Luria, one of the greatest Jewish Kabbalists and mystics of all time, who ultimately settled in the, settled in the holy city of Tzfas and taught Kabbalah there for two years, after which he died. But during those two years, he revolutionized the landscape of Jewish mysticism. The Arizal Rabbi Yitzchak Luria taught Kabbalah from 1570 to 1572, from Shin Lamed in the Hebrew calendar. Shin Lamed, hey Allah, from Shin Lamed to Shin Lamed base, and passed away at the age of 36. In 1570, the great Kabbalist Rabbi Moshe Cordovero, the Ramak, who was the great Kabbalist of Tzfas, the author of the Encyclopedia on Kabbalah, Pardus Ramonim, The Orchard of Pomegranates, and many other great works. Taimer Dvoira, The Palm of Dvorah, of Deborah, and others. He passed away in 1570, the month of Tammuz, Chav Gimel Tammuz, 23rd of Tammuz. The Arizal succeeded him. 
revealing new dimensions and layers in Kabbalah and passed away two years later, a very young age, at, on the day of Hay of the 5th of all, 1572. Who was his greatest student whom the Arizal entrusted to transcribe and transmit his teachings? It was none other than Rabbi Chaim Vital. Rabbi Chaim Vital passes away in 1620 in Damascus, and his son, Rabbi Shmuel Vital, is somebody who is a great rabbi, a judge, a Kabbalist, a prolific writer, an author. Many of his works are not printed. But one of his great contributions was he edited many of the manuscripts of his father, Rabbi Chaim Vital, and famously compiled the Shmoina Sha'arim, the eight portals of the teachings of the Arizal, which includes Shar Hapsukim, the, ver- the, the, the portal of verses which, where he edited all of his father's writings of the explanations of the Arizal on Torah. Now Rabbi Shmuel Vital often adds his own footnotes in the writings of Rabbi Chaim Vital transcribing the teachings of the Arizal. Usually he writes a footnote, Aleph Shin, which stands for Omar Shmuel, Shmuel said, referring to himself, Rabbi Shmuel Vital. And one of the places in which he adds a footnote, and a very significant one, is in Shar HaPsukim, the portal of verses that Rizal's explanations on the portion of Shlach in the Book of Numbers. The Arizal writes, when did the Jews find out that Moses will not enter into the land of Israel? When did this happen? Well, it's only in the 40th year after wandering the desert for 40 years, after this 39 years after the story of the spies, because as a result of the story of the spies, the Jews remained in the desert for another 38, 39 years. And at the end, a few months before they were supposed to enter the land, there was the story with the rock. God told Moses to speak to the rock and let it produce water. Moses struck the rock. After that story, God tells him, you're not going into the land. You will not enter the land. Your brother Aaron will not enter the land. And Aaron passes away on the first day of Av. Moses passes away a few months later on the seventh of Adar. And one month later, Joshua takes the Jewish people into the land. But when did the Jewish people find out that Moses will not enter into the land of Israel? So Darizal points out something fabulous and very interesting. The portion of Shlach comes after the portion of Baha'u'llah. In the portion of Baha'u'llah, we know that on the 20th of Eir, Less than one year since they stood at Sinai and received the Torah. The Torah says clearly, on the 20th of year, the second year after they left Egypt. So a little less than a year since the events at Sinai, the Jewish people traveled from the Sinai desert and relocated to a new place. There, they famously cried and lamented that they don't have meat and they're hungry and they don't have food. Moses complains to God that he can't bear the burden any longer. God tells him to commission and appoint 70 elders, 70 prophets to help him with the burden. And then suddenly there is a scene, and it's the scene of two people in the camp, Eldad and Medad, who start prophesizing. Now open up source number one, please, in your curriculum, the PDF below the video. A young lad comes running to Moses and says, Eldad and Medad are prophesizing on their own in the Jewish camp. Joshua tells Moses and he says, he's the servant of Moses, one of his best men. He says, my master Moshe Kloyim, incarcerate them. Zakt Rashi. Rashi brings two opinions. What does Kloyim mean? The first is Moshe says, Joshua says, Yeshua says to Moshe, impose upon them the needs of the community. And they will perish on their own. There's no need to kill them. Just make them community leaders. And they will already die. You want to destroy their life? Just turn them into community leaders. And don't worry. Their fate will be near. Tavarach, Hirashi says. This is the last paragraph of source number one. Put them in prison. Why? They were prophesizing that Moshe will die and Yehoshua, Joshua, is the one who will bring the Jews into the land of Israel. Joshua hears that they're prophesizing that Moshe is going to die and he will bring the Jews into Israel. And when did this happen? This happened a little more than a year after the exodus of Egypt. The exodus of Egypt was on the 15th of Nisan. This is one year later. 
a little after the 20th of year, a little more than a year later, they, two people are prophesizing that Moshe will not go into the land. Imagine the shock. Yeshua tells Moshe, put them in prison. Moshe refuses. In those majestic words discussed last week, Moshe says, you're jealous for me. You're jealous for my sake. If only the entire nation were prophets, if only God would give and confer his spirit upon every single Jew. Elder that made that, we're not uttering this prophecy quietly. The lad ran and told Moshe, Yehoshua heard about it. People heard what they are saying. And Moses confirmed that they were prophets and celebrated their prophecy. So 39 years before the decree, the Jews found out that there was a prophecy that Moses is going to die. And Joshua will bring the Jewish people into the land of Israel. Now it's interesting I saw in an ancient text by one of the great rabbis who says that their prophecy is actually hinted to in the very words. Open source number two. The lad tells Moses, Elder do Medad misnabim bamachana. Elder and Medad are prophesizing in the camp. The word misnabim is an acronym. Misnabim is mem, sof, nun, beis, aleph, yud, mem. Moshe, tehei. Nafshoi began Eloikim, Yehoshua Machnisam, which means Moses' soul will rest in God's garden in paradise. Joshua will bring them into the land. Comes Darizel and says in Parsha Shlach and Shar Hapsukim that this is the reason for something intriguing that happened. Take a look at source number three. The third source, Parsha Shlach, it says, the spies said we can't go into the land. Source number three, Parsha Shlach, Vayas Kalev es Ha'amel Moshe. Kalev, one of the spies, representing the tribe of Judah, made the nation silence to Moses. Vayoymer, and he said, We will go up. We will settle the land. We will prevail. We will be able to do it. But the other men who went up said, we cannot go up into the land. They are more powerful than us. Narizal says, why is Kalev the only one who silenced the people? Why not Yahushua? We know that there were two spies who remained loyal to Moses and to God. Kalev and Yehoshua. Kalev and Joshua. Yet we find that only Kalev was the one who made the nation silent and protested the ill-fated report of his colleagues saying we could enter the land. Why not Yehoshua? And the Arizal says because nobody would take Yehoshua's word seriously. Because everybody would say Yehoshua is motivated by ulterior and selfish motives since Elder then made that just prophesied that he will be the one to take the Jews into Israel, certainly he will not agree with the spies that they should remain in the desert. Certainly he would fight for entering the land because for him, this is his opportunity for power. The story of the spies happened shortly after the prophecy of Elder and made that the spies were sent out on the 29th of Sivan, that same year, just a few weeks later. They came back on Tisha B'Av on the 9th of all, 40 days later. Yehoshua, nobody would take seriously. They would attribute to him completely selfish motives. But Kalev had nothing to gain. The fact that he disagreed with the spies was meaningful, and therefore he was the one who could silence the Jewish people. With this, Darius, I'll explain something else. Take a look at the next source. Shlach Yud Gimel Tezayin. The Torah says, Eile Shmoisan, the next source, open, bring up. These are the name of the men which Moses sent to scout the land. Moshe changed the name of Hoshea, the son of Nun, to Yehoshua Joshua. Why did he change his name? So Rashi says, His of Moshe prayed for him. God shall save you 
from the scheme of the spies. And therefore he added a Yud to his name. Previously his name was Hosea. Moshe added a Yud in the beginning of his name, turning it from Hosea to Yehoshua. Thus the two first letters of his name really are the name of God, yud K. One of the names of God is yud K. Moses was praying that yud K Yoshiacha, yud K Hosea, God should help you and save you from the scheme of the spies. Why only for Yehoshua? If Moses felt that the spies are up to a scheme, why should he not pray for everybody? Why the prayer for Yehoshua? Says Darizal, because Moses was scared that the spies, if they have a scheme, will kill Joshua. Why will they kill Joshua? Because they will be certain that he will try to undermine their plan not to go into Israel. Why would they be certain that he will try to undermine their plan? Because they will feel he has an ulterior motive because he was prophet. He heard the prophecy that he will take the Jews into Israel, into the land. So therefore he will certainly not join forces with them. On the contrary, he will try to bury their idea. So therefore Moshe felt the need to pray for Yehoshua. Which this is what the Arizal says in Shaira Psukim. Comes Rabbi Shmuel Vital. Bring up the next source, please. Rabbi Shmuel Vital in Shaira Psukim Parsha Shlach says this. First he says, soon I'll read this source. First he says, Rabbi Shmuel Vital, since these words came out from the mouth of the teacher, alluding to the fact that the Arizal already started to reveal a new dimension, we can already explain the positive and virtuous motivations of the spies by gossiping about the land so that the Jews should not go into it. And look at his words. Liyoiz sheshamu, nevuas elda dumeidad Moshe meis v'yeshua machnes. Since they all heard the prophecy of elda and meidad that Moshe will die, and Joshua will bring the Jews into the land. Lachain toiv ladegas yeshua v'gam ligrim shaloi konsu Yisrael aretz v'yishar Moshe chay v'kayo. So it's good to kill Joshua and cause that the Jewish people should also not enter into the land so that Moses will remain chai v'kai and Moshe will remain alive. In other words, since they knew that the moment the Jewish people will enter into the land, Moses will have to pass away. Elder and made the prophesies that Moshe is not going to cross the border into the promised land. Whatever the reason for that may be, the story with the rock did not happen yet. It would happen decades later. And there are many reasons given for why Moses would not enter into the land of Israel. And ultimately, after all the reasons, it remains a mystery. And there's also the reason that Arizal himself gives in Shar Absuk and Baloischa and in other places. Rabbi Yitzchak Luria explains and says, the Gemara says in Baba Basra, that when Moshe Rabbeinu died and Joshua succeeded him, the elders of the generation were weeping and saying, What a shame. How humiliating. The face of Moshe is like the face of the sun. The face of Yeshua is like the face of the moon. Now we know Kabbalistically, the holiness of the land of Israel, Eretz Yisrael, represents the light of the moon. It represents the sanctity, the romance, and the luminescence of the moon. Moshe Rabbeinu is the face of the sun. What happens if when the moon is shining in the middle of the night, casting its romantic brightness, on the night owls, and suddenly the sun emerge, emerges in its ferocious might and intensity, what happens? The moon gets eclipsed completely. It's called daytime. Zaktehele Karizal, Moshe Rabbeinu is the face of the sun. Eretz Yisrael is the face of the moon. Moshe cannot go into the Holy Land so that he does not embarrass and eclipse the light of Eretz Yisrael, 
Joshua was the face of the moon, he could go into the land of Israel. You know the story in Chelem. They tell a story that in Chelem there was once a debate which one is superior, the sun or the moon. So they debated it for seven days and seven nights. And after a week they came up with the verdict that the moon is far more significant than the sun. Why? Because the moon shines when it's dark outside. But the sun, the sun shines during daytime. Who needs it? It's so light, it's so bright. Who needs the sun then? Therefore, the moon must be superior to the sun. But whatever the reason for Moshe not going into Eretz Yisrael and this explanation of the Arizal is beyond the scope of our discussion this evening, the spies know that the moment they're entering into the land, Moshe will pass away. On the contrary, if they don't enter into the land, if they stay in the desert, Moshe lives. And therefore, the spies decided, says Rabbi Shmuel Vital, that in order that Moshe should remain chai v'kayim in his words, that Moshe should remain alive, they will convince the entire nation not to go into the land of Israel because there's no hope for them in that land. They will be destroyed, they will be decimated, they will be annihilated. Knowing full well that it's a sin, knowing full well it's a transgression, knowing full well it's betraying Moses and God, perhaps knowing that they will be punished for this as they were punished severely. It was worth it for them so that Moshe Rabbeinu should remain alive with the Jewish people. These spies were crazy about Moshe. They were in love with Moshe. They were infatuated with endless affection and an attachment and a connection to Moses, lovesick with Moses, and they were ready to destroy the entire plan of God to go into the land so that Moses should live. And suddenly here we have another portrait a new portrait of these spies, of these miracles. We're dealing here with a group of Jews, prominent Jews, Jewish leaders, who were simply in love with Moshe Rabbeinu and would do anything that he should remain alive. And they were ready to undermine and destroy the whole promise, the dream, the goal, the destination. Just so that Moshe should remain with them. Now the fact is, and this is perhaps one of the most extraordinary components of the story, their dream was fulfilled. Moshe Rabbeinu lived because of them for another 40 years. Shepherding, teaching, giving, nurturing, leading, embracing his flock, the Jewish people, because of them. Yes, they engaged in a major historical error. You cannot fight with God and God's plans. God decreed that Moshe will pass away and Joshua will take the Jews into the land. But what Rabbi Shmuel Vital says is, understand where they were coming from. And look at the consequences. Notwithstanding the disaster, and notwithstanding their death, Moshe lived for another 40 years because the spies with the Jewish people. They fulfilled their dream. This explains and answers another very interesting thing. Take a look at your next source. God speaks to Moshe and Aaron and he says, How long will I have to endure this evil community? This is referring to the spies. From here we learn that a community is ten people. The source of a minion. How do you know that a community is ten people? We say ten Jews makes up a minion. It makes up an ada, a community. And once you have a community, which is ten people, then you could say a davar shepikdusha, you could say kaddish, you could say kedusha, you could say barchu, you could read the Torah, and do all of those tremendously spiritually elevating things that we can do only in the presence of a community. Where do we know this from? The spies. God calls them the evil community. How many spies came back with an evil report? Ten. Out of the twelve, Yeshua and Kalev were innocent. This is the source that Ada is ten people. Rashi takes this from the Gemara and Megillah and other places. The question is, how do we understand this? The source of what makes a community, what makes an Ada, 
This is the community with, which can recite something holy in public. Kaddish Baruch Hu is from the spies. There couldn't be any other better source for community besides Eidah Hara, an evil community. It's true. There is an interesting insight for one of the explanations that women are not counted as part of a minion in halacha and Jewish law. Why not? And one of the explanations is because the source of community of Ada, ten Jews making up a community, is from the story of the spies. The women we know were not part of this whole story. They said we're going into the land. They all disagreed with their husbands, and that's why the decree to remain in the desert was only on the men. It was not on the women, as the sages and rabbis and Rashi point out very clearly. Since the source of a minion is from that community which came together to give an ill report about the Holy Land, that's the source of a minion. A minion rectifies that. Women were not part of the problem. They're not part of the solution either. But notwithstanding this, this the question still must be asked. Couldn't the Torah give us a better source for community than Adar Ra, than an evil community? And not only that, we know about Sanhedrin, it says, Vishaftu Eida, Vitsilu Eida, the community shall judge and save. What's our Eida? Eida is ten people, we know it from the spies. A Russia can't be in Sanhedrin, a, a, a person who betrays the Torah can't be a member of the Jewish court. Here we have a glimpse, the Torah is intimating to us, that we have to understand the story of the spies on two layers. There is the revealed layer and there is the concealed layer. And the revealed layer, they obviously betrayed God's plan. They betrayed Moses' desire and they did a terrible thing. But there is a deeper component. The deeper component that's conveyed by Rabbi Shneir Zalman in Lekut Torah and by Rabbi Shmuel Vital in Shar HaPsukim, namely, these were very lofty souls, very great souls. This was a holy community who together came together and 10 people were ready to sacrifice themselves for one thing, for one purpose, so that Moshe Rabbeinu should not die, so that Moses, our teacher, should remain alive. That's a minion. This is a minion. 10 Jews coming together with this camaraderie, with this love, with this affection, affection with this sacrifice. This is a minion. This is an aid. And yet, two would not follow. Yehoshua and Kalev would not go along with them. Why? Yehoshua didn't want Moshe should live. Yehoshua is the one who screamed, Elder than made that are saying you're going to die, lock them up. Kalev didn't want Moshe should live. What was the difference between the ten and Yehoshua and Kalev? The difference is a profound one. And I want to discuss this now with you for a few minutes. To this we have to open our minds, open our hearts. The Torah defines Yahushua at the end of Baal Eishcha, quoted earlier, Mesharis Moshe, the servant of Moshe. He was Moshe's servant. The Torah defines Kalev in the Parsha Shlach, Va'avdi Kalev. Kalev, my servant. So Yeshua is defined as Mesharis Moshe, and Kalev is defined in Shlach Avdi Kalev, my servant Kalev. Ekev Haiseruach Acheres Imai. There was another spirit in him. Vayimale Acherai. He fulfilled my words. He and Yeshua will enter into the land, unlike the other spies who died right then. You see, there are two types of relationships. Two types of love, two types of connections between people, between one person and another person, between spouses, between parents and children, between friends, between disciples and their master and their rebbe, between a human being and God. There are two types of relationships. One is a relationship in which I love you. And one is a relationship in which I am one with you. No, obviously the two can be confused. If I love you, I want to be one with you. And if I'm one with you, I love you. That's true. But they represent two different paradigms 
and in many ways they can be contradictory. Love, I love you as much as it's about you, it's also about me. I love loving you. I cherish the experience. I am uplifted. I am inspired. I am invigorated. I feel good from loving you, being with you, being close to you, gazing at you, embracing you, being there for you. So I love you not only because of you, I also love you because of myself. I do it also myself. There's something about you that just gets my juices going, gets my juices flowing, brings out the best in me. You may be a part of me as it is with children, or you may not be a part of me as it is with friends, but there's something in you that I appreciate so much. So I love you because of myself as well. The second level, I am one with you, is a state of consciousness in which it's about you, it's not about me. It's not that I love loving you, and as a result of loving you, I gain so much. But rather, it's about you. It's about being there for you, not my gain and my experience from it. I transcend myself to become one with you, to be completely committed to you. What do we see the difference between the two? We see it when it's time to say goodbye. When the person I love wants me to go far away and do something for them, this is something they really desire. But in order to fulfill that, I have to say goodbye and depart and separate. Going to that place to fulfill that mission is not something I want. It's not something I will benefit from. On the contrary, it will compromise and deprive me from the ability of spending time and being close to the person I love. But I know that it's your desire. I know that this is your dream. It's your passion. It's what you want. So when I go there, I don't feel the experience of love as I would love to because you're not there. But I'm one with you because I'm not there because of me. I'm there because of you. So I'm far away. I can't speak to you and I can't hear you and I can't see you and I can't spend time with you. But why am I there? I'm there because you want me to be there. So by being there, I'm one with you. If I would remain close to you, I could say that I love you. But I'm not one with you. On the contrary, I love myself and therefore I want to appreciate you. I want to enjoy you. By leaving you and saying goodbye to you and going somewhere else, not for me, but because you want it. I'm there for you. Here we're actually one. Here we're actually united. You remember I sp we spoke once in one of the classes here on the yeshiva.net. It was Vayetze. Explaining the story in the Gemara in Ksuvah, Samachim by Rabbi Akiva. You remember the story with Rabbi Akiva? Rabbi Akiva was away from his home 12 years. His wife, Rachel, wanted he should study Torah. So he was away for 12 years from his home. Succeeded tremendously. Came home. And as he's, re right, and he's ready to enter into the house, he hears his wife, Rachel, telling somebody else that if I would have it my way, I would send him to learn for another 12 years. So what does Rabbi Akiva do? He turns around. And he goes back to the yeshiva and he studies for another 12 years. And this time he comes back home with 24,000 students. And when his wife comes out to greet him and the students don't know who she is, what does Rabbi Akiva tell 24,000 students? Shali v'shalachem. Shalahu. What I have and what you have all belongs to her. And everybody asks the question, granted, why didn't he go in to drink a cup of coffee with her? Why didn't he go in to have dinner with her? Spend a few hours, spend the night, spend the weekend, spend the weekend, then go back to yeshiva for 12 years. You're coming home already. Go in, say hi. Spend time with the woman. Obviously, you cherish this woman. She gave up a lot for Rabbi Akiva. She sacrificed her father, her family, her money for Rabbi Akiva. As we know, we discussed in the story, it's a famous story beyond the scope of tonight's class. They had a great relationship. He's doing this for her. She wants it. 
Go in, say hi, spend time, enjoy each other, then go back to learn. There's different explanations, but what's one of the great explanations, and we discussed this at length in Vayetze, the great explanation is that there's two types of relationships. There's I love you, and there's I'm one with you. Rabbi Akiva was very close to his wife. He didn't only love his wife. He was completely committed to his wife. He was completely one with his wife. He transcended himself. It was not about him. It was about her. What was her passion? What was her dream? Rabbi Akiva lived in the decades following the destruction of the Second Temple when the Roman Empire threatened to bury for eternity Judaism, Torah, and the Jewish people. Rachel, his wife's dream was should not be forgotten from the Jewish people after the devastating horror and destruction and blood baths flowing in Israel as a result of the Romans. Indeed, who was the one who secured that Torah would survive? It was Rabbi Akiva. The Gemara says, Kulu alibadir Rabbi Akiva. The entire oral tradition we have is from Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva is the one who rebuilt Torah from the ashes, so to speak. And who identified this potential in Rabbi Akiva? One person, Rachel, his wife, Rachel. He was a simple shepherd, a peasant, an illiterate. Rabbi Akiva describes in Psachim, he was a hater of scholars. He knew nothing. And she married him. She identified, she was a daughter of Kalba Savu, of a great prominent philanthropist, great Jew. Why? Because she pro- asked Rabbi Akiva to promise her that he's going to learn. And that's why she married him. She identified his potential. And she stubbornly was determined to materialize it, and she materialized it. Rabbi Akiva knew this about his wife. He could have gone into the house, hi Rachel, sit down, drink a cup of tea, eat, shmua, spend time, and so on and so forth. And then he would feed and nurture his love, his passion, his excitement, his enthusiasm. But Rabbi Akiva was a deeper husband. Rabbi Akiva wanted to fulfill his will, not nourish, fulfill her will, not nourish her love, his love. Fulfill her will, not nourish his love. Well, the Freudian slips here. So what does he do? He leaves the house and he goes back to learn. Knowing that every single moment that he's physically and geographically separated from his wife, physically, he's actually one with her. Because why is he in the yeshiva? Because she wants it. Why is he learning for another 12 years? Because it's her desire and her dream. He's there because of her. So every moment he's separated physically from her, he's one with her. He's doing what she wants. He's fulfilling her desire, her passion. It's about her. If he would remain in his house, he would be close to her, but he would be one with himself, not one with her. The spies loved Moshe Rabbeinu, but they weren't one with Moshe. They loved him, they cherished him, they appreciated him, they were ready to do everything that he should live, but they weren't one with him. Moshe wanted that the Jewish people should enter into the land because this is the ultimate divine purpose and objective to transform the physical world into a divine place. Did they love Moses? No question. Does Reb Shmuel Vital extol their virtue and show us who they were? Yes. Can our hearts melt ultimately when we think about what the Miraglim did and what they accomplished? Yes. But a sin it was. Relative to their great level, it was a sin. The fact that they influenced all the Jews was a sin. And the higher you are, the more sensitive even sins of love are. But this was not an ugly sin. It was a very beautiful sin. It was a very loving sin. But a sin it was. They loved Moses. They wanted to be with Moses. But they weren't one with Moshe. To be one with Moshe means to fulfill his will, to be committed to his desire. Now we can see how the explanation of Reb Shmuel Vital can be synchronized with the explanation of the Alter Rebbe, Rebbe Shnei Zaman of Liadi and Lukut Torah, because we're operating here on the same two levels. The spies wanted to remain in the desert because they wanted spirituality. They wanted God. They wanted Moshe. Why did they want it? 
because they were great people. They wanted love. They wanted to be near the music. They wanted to be near the central nervous system of spirituality. They wanted to taste and feel the presence of God, which in the desert you can feel and taste every day. Why should they go in to a material society and a physical landscape? We have to deal with the pressures of the psyche and the ego and of the neighborhood and the environment and everything that comes with real mundane normal life when you can bathe and bask in the transcendental oasis in the island called the Midbar, the desert. But what does God want? This is what you want. You want to be close to God. But what does God want? God sent your soul away from heaven. God said the Jewish people have to go into the land because God wants you to transform your psyche, your body, your instincts, your appetites, your beastly soul, your world into holiness. Ah, you say, why do I have to go into this land? It's not a place of holiness, but that's his will. So when you do that, you are one with him because you're there for him, not for you. And that's the paradox. We discussed then in the portion of Ayetze and Halacha, there's two types of people. There's a sachir, a payal, and a shliach. There's an employee who works in your office or in your close proximity, is there with you a whole time. And then there's a shliach who's a messenger whom you send away to a place where you cannot be. Who's closer to you geographically? The payal, the sachir, the employee, he works with you. The shliach is much further. And yet halachically we say, your shliach is like you. The shliach, the messenger, is like the one who sent him halachically. We don't say the same thing about the poyal and the sachir as we discussed then at length. And so on and so forth. Again, I don't want to get into the details now, just referencing it. What's the difference? Why you don't we say that on the employee? He's right near you. And the answer is, why is the employee working for you? Because he needs a salary. He's right near you, but he's doing it for himself. So he's not you. The shliach usually doesn't do it for money. He's an emissary whom you sent on a mission. So why is he there? He's there for you. He's there for the mishaleach. He's there for the one who sent him. He's not there for his own family and for his own needs and for himself. So geographically, he's remote from the Meshalech. He may be thousands of miles away. But spiritually, metaphysically, they're one. He's there for him. So therefore, he is him. The employee is right near the boss. But it's all for himself. The Jew could be in the desert near God. Enjoying, appreciating, embracing. But he's appreciating it. She's enjoying it. When I go far away to a lowly place, and in this case, it's not a lowly place, it's a holy place, but relative to the state in the desert, they had to metamorphosize their life. Here, there's a different experience. Here, I may not be enjoy it because I'm not in close proximity with the revelations that existed in the desert when Moshe is there, when the, when, when the clouds of glory are there, and so on and so forth. But here I become you. Here I transcend myself because I'm here for you to fulfill your desire, your dream. Here I become one with what you want. But the spies certainly loved Moses. Now, there's a fascinating story in Gemara that reminds us of the explanation of Rabbi Shmuel Vital. Bring up the next source. The Gemara in Ksuvist of Kovdalad Amar Aleph. Zog de Heleke Gemara Ha'hu yoyme de noch nafshe de Rebbe Gozru Rabbon and Tanis It's the day that Rebbe, Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi who lives at the end of the 100s, the beginning of the 3rd century at the end of the 100s, the beginning of the 200s after the Common Era the editor of the Mishnah, Rabbi Judah the Prince, lives in Sipari and he's very ill. The day that he dies, the Rabbanon, they make a fast, they decree a fast day. Ubo they ask for mercy. 
the Amri and they declare, Kol man the Yomar noch nafsha the Rebbe Yedoker Becherif. Whoever shall declare that Rebbe died, that Rebbe's soul rested, a euphemism for death, shall be stabbed with a sword. Slika am the Rebbe Ligra. The maid servant of Rebbe, Rabbi Yehuda, went up to the roof. Amra on the roof, she said, El Yoinim of Akshinus Rebbe, Vatachtoinim of Akshinus Rebbe. The higher angels want Rebbe, and the lower people, the lower creatures in this world want Rebbe. Yerotzen Shiyakufu Tachtoinim of El Yoinim, may it be the will of God that the lower ones, the lower creatures, prevail over the higher creatures, that Rebbe lives. Kivan the Chazoi Kamazim Nidaya Lebeis Akisiv Echolatz Tefillin Omanach Lu Bekomet Stayer. But then she saw how many times he had to go to the bathroom. As Rashi explains, Rebbe suffered from a terrible illness in his intestines. And therefore he always had to go to the bathroom. And she saw how many times. And each time he has to take off his tefillin and then put them on again. And he's so aggravated. He has so much agony. Amra, she said, May it be the will of God that the higher creatures prevail over the lower creatures. That Rebbe gets rid of his agony and he passes away. But the rabbis were not stopping to pray. So she took something, she threw it down from the roof. And the bang caused them to stop praying and Rebbe passed away that moment. And the rabbis told Bar Kapora, go check the situation. He went and he saw that Rebbe died. He tore his garment and he tucked in, he, 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 he put in the tear backwards so that you don't see it. He came out and he told the rabbis, The higher angels and the righteous ones down here were holding on to the holy ark. The angels prevailed over the tzaddikim, the righteous people down there, and the holy ark was captured and seized. They said, Rebbe passed away. He said, You said that. I didn't say that. Fascinating. What do they mean when they say, whoever will say that Rebbe died shall be stabbed? Who speaks this way? And what do you mean whoever says it? The Rebbe was very sick. Everybody passes away. Moses passed away and Yeshua passed away. King David passed away. Rabbi Yechonah ben Zakkai passed away. Rabbi Akiva passed away. God wants he should die, he'll die. Say Kaddish, learn Mishnayis, find a new Rebbe, he'll be fine. But for them, there was something different going on. The Marsha writes in the next source, open the next source, based on who he was, his Torah and his deeds, he was worthy to live forever. They come, somehow could not make peace with the fact that Rebbe should die. To the extent that somebody who says, Noch the Rebbe, you becherev. That's a death sentence for him. What they mean is, Rebbe embodies life, Rebbe is the essence of life by Rebbe dying and by somebody embracing that truth. It's their own death sentence. They're stabbing themselves in the sword. In the sword, in the sword. They cannot conceive of life without Rebbe. That's who they were. That was their relationship with him. That was their connection with him. For them, there's no life without Rebbe. He was their lifeline. He was their connection. Yudok Ebecherah. I once saw a word from the Sar Shalom, the Helika Sar Shalom of Bells. A Hasidic homiletical insight. He said what it means like this. It means this. Call me Shalim and Nach Nafsha the Rebbe. Whoever says Rebbe's soul is resting once it dies will be stabbed with a sword. Because Yitzchak told Esau, Al Char you will live with your sword. And what's the Yeshua, what's the hope that the Jewish people have to be rescued from the sword? Hakol Kol Yaakov, when Jacob has his voice, so then the hands of Esav, the Adayimi, the Esav don't prevail. Rebbe was the embodiment of Torah of Yaakov. As long as Rebbe is functioning and operating and helping and inspiring and sustaining, 
we're saved from the sword. But somebody who says, Nach nafshe de Rebbe, somebody who says, after Rebbe died, Nach nafshe, Rebbe goes on vacation. His soul went to paradise. He found a nice shtend and he's sitting and learning himself. Kol mi shoymen, Nach nafshe de Rebbe, if you think the Rebbe's soul is now resting, yidoker becherev. This is a death sentence for the Jewish people, God forbid. Rebbe's soul does not stop seeking and yearning and inspiring and helping and blessing the Jewish people. And yet, they said, no way. And the servant of Rebbe, his maid, said, yes. Why? It's hard to speculate about this, but it seems they were thinking about the fact they want Rebbe in the world. They can't have a world without Rebbe alive physically. His maid servant was thinking about one thing. He was in terrible agony. She was thinking about him. They were thinking about themselves and their love. You see the difference? That's the difference between the spies and Yeshua and Kalev. Yeshua is Mesharis Moshe. He's a servant. Kalev is Avdi Kalev, a servant. Like Rebbe's servant. It wasn't about their love to Moshe. It was what Moshe wants. It's what who Moshe is. The Arizal says in Shara Psukim and in other places that Kalev was a reincarnation of whom? Of Eliezer, the Eved Avram, the servant of Avram. That's why it says that the spies went to Hebron and the sages derived from the verses and Rashi says that Kalev left everybody and where did he go to? He went to the cave of the Machpelah in Hebron to pray at the grave of the patriarchs. Why Kalev? The answer that Arizal says is because Kalev was a reincarnation of Eliezer, the servant of Avram. Eved Avram Anoichi. He went to the grave sites of his, of his master, Avram. This is Kalev. That's why he's called Avdi Kalev, my servant Kalev. Because he was the embodiment of an Eved, like the maid in the story of Yudah Anasi. The spies were great people. They were obsessed with love, in love with Moshe Rabbeinu. But they weren't thinking about him. And deeper than love is to actually, to actually be there for the person. Yeshua and Kalev understood. This is what Moshe wants. And since this is what Moshe wants, so this is where Moshe is. And by doing this, you may not feel the great energy and the great light but by going out and fulfilling Moshe's mission, even though Moshe's physical presence is not there, you will be one with Moshe and one with Moshe's master, Almighty God. Have a good night.